Good morning. Let's t turn to Colossians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 9 this morning. But as we're turning there, that song that we just sang, Jesus, Holy and Anointed One. Jesus, I love you. I trust that's the reason you're here this morning. Not because it's a ritual that we do, but because we are in love with the Savior. And uh, we'll come back to some more of that as we work our way through the passage. Beginning in verse 9, for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your trespasses or transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Shortly into my first pastorate, I received a call from a lady that I had not met and still haven't met. I have no idea who she is or was, but uh, it was one of those phone calls that kind of a little bit difficult for a new pastor. Uh, her question was, which was simple enough, her question was, do you baptize infants? And uh, I explained to her, no, that we did not baptize infants, but I said we do have a, a time when we, we dedicate the, the children. Uh, and I explained, what, well, she asked what was involved in that, and I said, well, the, basically the parents or sometimes the grandparents come because she was a grandmother and they had just had a, a new grandchild born and they wanted to have him baptized. And I don't know where the parents were, why the grandmother was calling me, but she was the one that made the call. Uh, and I explained that it was a, a time when the parents committed themselves to raising that child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and we would pray for them and, and the church would stand behind them in, in seeking to, to see that realized. She said, oh, she said, that's not what we want. She said, we're not really what you would call religious. We don't even know if there is a God. And uh, uh, she said, we have no intention of teaching this little child about God. We, if when he becomes an adult, if he wants to worship God, we're not opposed to that. But we're not going to try to, to teach him anything about God. I said, well, if that's the case, why are you concerned about having him baptized? That probably wasn't the best question to ask, but I, I don't always ask the best questions. And, and she said, well, she said, we don't believe there is a God, but we might be wrong. <laughs> so just in case, she said, we want to cover all the bases. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think we can help you in that matter. But uh, rites and traditions, are familiar to all of us. Many people recognize three of them. It's when the child is born, they want a time of dedication. And then when it comes to a wedding, they, they want a church wedding. They want, uh, I, I've done a lot of weddings over the years. And a lot of times I have done weddings for people that have no church contact, don't come to church, but uh, have a desire to get, way, get married. And, I, and, and as long as they're willing to go through the premarital course that I offer, I. I work with them and, and have done many wedding ceremonies that way. But, but I always like to ask them, why is it important that you have a church wedding? And they, they always invariably want to have God bless their, their relationship. And I say, and yet you have nothing to do with them. <laughs> How do you expect that to happen? Uh, uh, and then the third time is when someone passes away, they, they want a good send off. <laughs> And, and so we have those basic traditions, basic rites that we follow. And there's nothing wrong with the traditions. Uh, they, they often mark 
achievements and growth in our life, we celebrate birthdays, or at least some people do. I, I told my family last year I wasn't having a birthday, <laughs> but they didn't let me get by with that. Uh, we, we celebrate weddings, we celebrate graduation times, and, and even the passing uh, of, of people. I, I remember shortly before my wife's mother passed away, she made it known that she didn't want a memorial service or a, any, any service or whatever. And we had to say, we're sorry, Mom, but uh, we're going to do it anyhow. <laughs> because it's not for you. You're going to be with Christ in glory. It's for the family that's left behind. And, and it, it was important right, right of passage that we felt ha had to take place. Last week, we looked at the fact that if we're not careful, we can embrace the shadows and miss the substance, miss the, the, the meaning behind the rite or the tradition that we celebrate. And uh, the problem in that is not in the tradition, it's, it's how we look at it. We, we have a tradition here as a church that on the first Sunday of each month, we celebrate the Lord's table. Now, some churches do that every month, some every week, some once a year. The, the, the amount of time isn't the important issue there. It's do we take the time when we do it to focus on who Christ is and what he has done for us? Or is it just something that we go through? We've done it so many times we can do it without thinking. The, 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 there's a purpose for it. Do we honor that purpose as we celebrate the Lord's table? I want us to look at some rites of passage as we look through this particular passage. But as we do that, there are two questions that we want to look at. The first one is, what has Christ done for us? And the reason I chose to word it that way is, if you notice in verse 9, it's in him. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. He is the one that is important in the rites or the traditions. We, we need to keep our focus on who is he and what is he doing in us. So what has he done for us? The first thing that we find here is found in verse 10. Christ has made us complete. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we read, if any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creation. And God is not in the business of creating junk. He has created us to be in the image of, of his son, Jesus Christ. It's the result of, in John chapter 3, verse 3, the new birth. Jesus said, unless you'll be born again, you can't have part there in the kingdom of God. You must be born again, he said. It's important to remember that in Christ, through that new birth, we have all that we need for life, for salvation, and for our spiritual growth. It's all found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ in our behalf. Did you ever notice a little baby comes as a complete package? Uh, we don't have to add the hands. We, we don't have to add the feet. They, they, they're, they're complete. Uh, they're created as God intended them to be for a purpose in this life. We had uh, the privilege of welcoming our first great-grandchild in, into our family this week. And uh, we, we've seen pictures of him. We haven't actually seen them yet, but we've seen pictures of them, and somebody's not going to be content until they actually get there and see them. But uh, that, that'll be a, about a month from now. But it, that little child is complete. All we need to do is provide the nourishment and the guidance for him to become what God wants him to be. And it, the same thing is true in the spiritual life. When we were born again, God came into our life and, and indwelled us there. We don't need to add anything to that new birth for us to experience the, the blessing of God up, upon our lives. We don't have to be saved by faith plus works. We don't have to have a special experience or even a special gift to be a child of God. And, and as we think about that, I think it's important for us to remember there are no second-class citizens in God's family. We're all first-class citizens. We've all been made complete in Jesus Christ. We are new creatures in Christ. I realize as I say that, that there will be changes in our life as we grow and mature. There will be changes in our attitude and actions. There will also eventually one day be a new body. But 
we are basically complete in Christ. And, and in his sight, that process is complete. Philippians 1, 6 says, He that hath begun a good work in you will do what? Perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what he started in your heart when you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, he is going to see that work finished. You're not going to see it finished. He's going to see the work done. And, and you're going to rejoice in that in Christ because we are complete in him. The second thing he mentions for us here is that Christ has circumcised us in, in verse 11 there. Paul often confronted problems in this area with the Judaizers. Uh, they taught that you had to have, to be a child of God, you had to have faith in Christ plus be circumcised. That comes out of their old Jewish tradition there. Uh, it was settled in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15, the church had a brought together the elders and the apostles and, and they wrestled with that issue and they came to the conclusion that to be part of the family of God you simply need to have that faith in Jesus Christ. You need to accept him as your personal savior. They didn't add anything to that as far as salvation was concerned. And yet we have the similar teachings today. We have those who teach that if you want to be complete, you want to be spiritual, you need Christ plus works. Or you need Christ plus a special experience or a second work of grace or, or Christ plus the exercise of a gift there. The fact is, Jesus Christ did it all for us. And we can rest in that fact today. I had a lady come to me again in my first pastorate and... Uh, she came about 9 o'clock at night. Now, I am open for visitation. I'm here at the office four, days, four mornings a week. I'll come to your home in the afternoon or early evening. But 9 o'clock at night is not a good time for me. My system is just beginning to shut down at that time. I'm, I'm a morning person, not a, a night person. But she came, and so we invited her in and had uh, something to I guess it was tea that gender served. And we're sitting at the table, and I'm sitting there wondering, why in the world is, is she here at this hour of the night? And finally, we got around to why she was there. She said, Pastor, uh, while I appreciate your teaching, I don't think you have the Spirit of God in your life. And uh, I said, well, why do you think that I don't have the Spirit of God in my life? And she says, well, it's obvious because you don't speak in tongues. And uh, at, at that point, I knew where the conversation was going, but I had to ask those questions again. Uh, she, I said, why is that so important to you? And she said, well, it's all through the Bible. You, you, everywhere you look, you find it. And I said, where would you find it in the Old Testament? And she had a ready answer for that. She said, if you go into the story of the, of the priest, you will find that on the bottom of the hem of their robes, they tied bells. And those bells were a sign of speaking in tongues. That was kind of a new thought to me. I, I'd never quite thought of it that way. And we discussed that. Uh, and I said, well, you know, it, it says in the New Testament, not all speak in tongues. Uh, I said, how, how do you wrestle with that? She said, well, if you're going to be spiritual, you have to speak in tongues or else you don't have the spirit. So I, I said to her, what you're saying is, I'm not a child of God then. I'm not a Christian. And uh, that kind of threw her for, she said, oh, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. But I said, well, Romans 8, chapter 9 says, if anyone hath not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. So if I don't have the Spirit of God, I'm not one of his. I'm not a Christian. Well, we, we parted with that thought, and eventually she left the church to join with an ultra charismatic group that was trying to form a church in the community and that was the last we saw of her there but Christ has purchased our salvation for us now in the Old Testament the act of circumcision was merely a shadow of Christ it was not a means for them to be part of the family of God. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when you go back to Genesis chapter 15, in verse 6, you read the story of Abraham. Abraham had just gone through a difficult time. He had rescued his, his nephew Lot from uh, being taken captive. He had at least five kings in the surrounding areas upset with him. And uh, 
they were the type of people that would get revenge if they could. And, and so here he is facing that difficulty. Uh, the ones that he saved were from Sodom and Gomorrah. They were not very friendly toward him either. And, and so uh, he's wondering what in the world is going to happen. And God comes to him and speaks to him and assures him that, that he is going to, to bless him, that he would take care of him. And we read in verse 6 that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so there he exercised his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He was not circumcised until 24 years later, just before the, the birth of Isaac, uh, or, or before Isaac was on the way there. God came to him and gave him this sign of circumcision. It was a sign that they were part of the family of God. It did not make them a part of the family of God. It was a, a, just a symbol, a shadow of, of what Christ had done, would do for us. And uh, Romans 4, 9 and following uh, covers all of that for us. I'm not going to take time to read that this morning. Today we might have a child circumcised for medical reasons. There, there is nothing wrong with that, but I think we need to realize that it will not save a person any more than infant baptism would save a person. Well, I had a, a man in our, our first church, uh, I had a lot of things happen in our first church. <laughs> uh, we had a vacation Bible school one year, and his, I think he was eight or nine years of age at the time, his son accepted Christ as his personal savior. And we thought, this is great, There's something to celebrate about. Until I got a call from the father, and he was very upset and angry. And so I went to visit him to find out what was going on. And he said, what right did you have to lead my child to Christ? He doesn't need to do that. I said, what do you mean he doesn't need to do that? He said, well, we had him baptized as an infant. And so he was part of the family of God from that moment on. I explored that area with him and wasn't getting anywhere until I came up with the idea. Uh, I knew him well enough that I knew his sister was having some real serious issues in her life. She was living a, a wild lifestyle, uh, it had nothing to do with the Lord, and I said, did your parents have your sister baptized? And he said, oh, yes, all of, the, all of us were baptized. I, I said, do you think she's headed for heaven the way she's living? Uh, there's no evidence that she's worshiping God or uh, uh, she's living a very immoral lifestyle. He said, well, she's what we call an unsaved Christian. <laughs> I said, what's an unsaved Christian? <laughs> She said, well, because she was baptized, God is obligated to get her into heaven some way. I, she said, we don't know how, but that, he, he's got to do it because we had her baptized. Uh, to, to his credit, about a year later, they, they moved out of the area, and, and we kept in contact with the family. And, and in his new job, he came into contact with somebody that worked with Campus Crusade for Christ. And he accepted Christ as his personal savior. So it, uh, he, he suddenly realized why it was important that his, his son had done this, the same thing as, as well. For us, spiritual circumcision uh, that, that he's talking about in verse 11, I believe, is the removal of the body of the flesh. Uh, the removal, the idea behind that is doesn't, he, he hasn't taken the old nature away from us yet, but he's made it inoperable in our lives. We do not have to, because we've been circumcised, because he has done that for us, we do not have to serve sin any longer. The old nature hasn't been eradicated, but with the new nature, we can live in the power of Jesus Christ. We can walk in that power because we are complete in Christ. We've been justified, and now we're a work in progress. So he has circumcised us. He has also, in verse 12, baptized us. Now, uh, baptism is a familiar rite. Uh, we do it many times in many places. I have done baptism in a, in a pool in, the, in a church. I've used lakes and rivers. Uh, I've used swimming pool. Well, I think one of the, the best times was, I, it was 
pretty cold outside, and a young fellow wanted to be baptized. And we didn't have, we were meeting in a senior center, so we didn't have a, a, a place there where we could baptize. And when it's snow out there, I'm not too enthused about going out to a lake <laughs> for a baptism. I, I hate cold water. And uh, one of the families in the church had a hot tub. And they said, why don't you come and use the hot tub? And I thought that was great. <laughs> the water was a perfect temperature there. And so we had a, a baptism in, in the hot tub. The important thing is not the place, nor is it a means to salvation. The important thing to remember is we are baptized as a step of obedience to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 28 and 19, he encouraged them to go and make disciples of all nations. And he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is a picture of the baptism that Christ has already done for us. We are baptized through the work of Jesus Christ. And the physical baptism, the water baptism, just pictures what has already taken place in our heart and life. In Romans chapter 6, it speaks, speaking there of baptism, he said, we have been, we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, we're raised to walk in newness of life. Something has happened in our life. We've accepted Christ as our personal savior. And the actual act of physical baptism becomes a testimony to what has taken place in our hearts and our lives. One of the reasons I, even though I hate the cold water, uh, do a baptism in, in a lake or, or a cold river is because it's an opportunity to publicly proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ. And the world can look on it and see that something is happening there. It's an act of identification with Christ and with his, his family. The, I personally was baptized two times. When I was about three years old, I was baptized, should have been baptized as, as an infant. My, my mother came from the, uh, a Methodist background. They, they didn't go to church. I had, as far as I know, had heard nothing about God or the Bible until I was eight or nine years of age. They, they never talked about it. Uh, we had a Bible that sat on a coffee table in our living room, but nobody ever opened it. No, nobody ever read it. He, I, I guess they recorded some wedding dates and and when somebody died in it, but that, that, that's all it, it meant. The, the only, I, I remember the baptismal experience, which is unusual for infant baptism. The only reason I remember it is because I had two older brothers. And uh, for a, a week or two before I was to be baptized, they teased me unmercifully. They convinced me that this man was going to dump a bucket of cold water on my head and, and on and on went the, the images that they gave me of, of infant baptism. And so it, it stuck with me in, in, in my mind. But you know, after I came and accepted Christ as my personal savior about the age of 12, uh, the, our pastor spoke of having a baptismal service and, and the need for it and asked if I would like to do that. And, and well, if it was a step of obedience that God wanted, I was certainly willing to do it. And so uh, I, uh, I went through the, the waters of baptism. That's the only one that had any, any meaning, any, any value as far as I was concerned. I was doing what God had asked us to do. And then the fourth thing that he's done for us is he has made us alive. He sums it up for us in Ephesians chapter 2 says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Can you identify with that? Can you look back on your life and, and realize you were spiritually dead? You, you were walking contrary to the ways of God. You, you had nothing to do with him there. You were following the, the prince of the power of the air. Uh, it says, among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We have been made alive in Christ. We were dead before them. Remember the story of Adam and Eve. God 
uh, told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And they ate and they died. It broke that relationship with God. They were dead to God at that point. Eventually they physically died as well. But in that moment that they chose to eat, they died spiritually. And the only hope for them was to be reborn uh, and, and to be brought back to life again. We have been born again, made alive through the power of Christ. Uh, if, uh, it's not if we hang on. It, it, it's not if we work that we are, are made alive. It's because he has died for us and we are in Christ today. Now, as I think about that, I, I remember teaching a, a section on the, the doctrine. We're, we're looking at uh, systematic theology in Sunday school, and, and uh, I, I like to tear it apart and, and look at, at different areas. So one time in one church, I was teaching on the, the doctrine of soteriology, which is, anybody pick that up from Sunday school? It's a doctrine of salvation and was going through how we are saved and, and what's involved in it and so forth. And I, I explained to him that some people teach that we are saved by grace plus works. You've you got to hang on to the end. And, and uh, of course, I, I wasn't teaching that viewpoint, but I, I, I was sharing that that's what some people do. There, there was a fellow in the class that uh, it was rather outspoken, and, and he said, you know, if I believed that, he said, and he had not heard that before, but uh, he said, I if that were true, he said, my salvation would last two seconds <laughs> and I'd be done. <laughs> and uh, I have to agree with him. We, we can't do it ourselves. Our eternal security rests on the fact that we have been made alive through the work of Jesus Christ. It's not our work, it's his. He has done it for us. And so as we think of all that he has done, I trust that you take some time this week and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done in our hearts and in our lives. Give, give him the praise and glory that, that's to his name. And then how does God see us today? That's the second question we want to wrestle with from this passage. How does he see us today? You know, sometimes we, do you ever look at your life and see the shortcomings and the failures? And the, the times when you don't do what you're supposed to do and so forth. Uh, and you ever begin to wonder, well, how could God love me? You, you ever wrestle with some of those doubts? Uh, it, uh, the, the, it's not fun when we, we, we do that. But how does God actually view us today? Three things here. He sees us as our sins are forgiven in verse 13. It says, and we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but then he said, he has forgiven us all of our transgressions. I like Psalm 103, verse 12, where he speaks of the fact, the psalmist said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our transgressions from us. And that, as I said before, is a long ways. If, if you start walking east today, you can go round and round the globe. You're never headed west. That, that, that's a long ways. You, you can't say that about north and south, but you can say that about east and west. You get the feeling when you read scripture that God knew what he was talking about, don't you? He, he didn't compare north and south. He compared east and, and, and west there. That's how far God has removed our sin from us. First John 1 John 1.9 said, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, in the Old Testament, it says when he forgives us, in Jeremiah, he said, he remembers it no more. Don't you wish you could do that? Don't you wish you could blank it out of your mind and it never comes to your attention again? God does. As a matter of fact, in Hosea, he speaks of the fact that it's buried in the depths of the, the deepest sea, and, and that's a long ways down. Don't let Satan discourage you and defeat you because of sin in your past. Yes, you probably have some that you wish you hadn't done. Uh, acted in some ways or said some things uh, and, and you wonder how your life would be different if you hadn't done that. But if you have confessed it, it is gone. 
I like that little chorus that we used to sing in Sunday school. Gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. They're, they're buried in the depths of the sea, deepest sea. And it goes on to say, praise God, my sins are G-O-N-E, gone. That is true of us today. Our sins have been forgiven because Jesus Christ has forgiven them through his work on the cross. And then he says, our debts have been paid. Uh, they've been canceled now. And how? That certificate in verse 14 of debt, that bill that we was owing, it's been nailed to the cross. And it is settled. It is finished. That's what Christ cried on the cross. That literally means it is paid. He paid for the, the debt that we owed. He satisfied the demands of a holy God. Years ago, we moved from... Grangeville to, to cul-de-sac, we had an old car that was on its last few miles there. We, we had a friend that, that helped us move, and uh, he wasn't from our church. He, he went to another church in town, but I, I used to preach in that church. Uh, the, when their pastor was gone, uh, I would fill in for him. He would fill in me. It worked out fine. We, we were only a block apart. And their service started at 10. Ours started at 11. So uh, as long as the preacher kept his sermon to within a, a reasonable time limit, it was not a problem. And when they lost their pastor then for several months, I, I, I filled in for them. So I got to know Jim. And then Jim found out that uh, we were burning wood in our house. And Jim, while he was a state patrolman, he loved cutting wood. He had been a logger, and he looked for any excuse to go out and, and cut firewood. And so he said, hey, you need firewood. Let's go out and cut some firewood. And he would come by every once in a while and say, it's time to go out and get some more wood. And I'd say, Jim, I've got enough for more than enough for the coming year. And that wasn't sufficient for Jim. You had to have at least three year supply in, uh, if not more. And he did that for his whole family there. But one day after we moved, Jim called up and said, you know, my neighbor has a car for sale and it's quite reasonable. And I think you'd like it if you saw it. Uh, and so he said, why don't you come up and, and take a look at it? Well, we couldn't go up for a few days, but we eventually got up there only to find out that Jim had bought the car. He, he was convinced that that we would want it. And he said, I don't want to put any pressure on you if you don't like it or for some reason don't want it. You don't have to buy it. He said, I'll, I'll resell it. That's not a problem. And we looked at it and liked it. The only problem was we didn't have the cash for the deal. And Jim said, you just pay what you can for a down payment and you can make monthly payments. He said, I don't care how much it is a month, but whatever you feel you can do, that, that's fine with me. He said, I don't need the money at this point in time. And so we started paying Jim $100 a month to, to pay off the car until Christmas came. And we had been in town doing our Christmas shopping and all that kind of nonsense. And... Uh, we came home, and here's an envelope stuck in our door. And in the envelope, I opened it up. Here was the, the last check I had written to Jim, and a note saying, the debt has been paid, the car is yours. And there was the certificate. Uh, uh, it, it, it really blessed our hearts in, in that time. And that's what Christ has done for us. He satisfied the demands of a holy God, so much so that he took that bill, and in a sense, he nailed it to the cross and stamped it paid. It was taken care of in Christ. Uh, in a sense, it was like our receipt. Receipts are important there. Years ago, we were living in Quinell. We heated our house with uh, natural gas. And so every month I'd get a, a bill from the gas company. I'd go down to their office. I'd pay the bill. And everything was fine until one day I got a notice in the mail saying, you didn't pay your last bill. If it's not settled immediately, we're going to cut off your gas supply. And uh, I dug out my bill, and it was marked paid, so I took it down, and I showed the lady in the office, and uh, she said, why don't you just leave that receipt with us for a few days, and we'll get this settled out. And I thought, how stupid do you think I am? <laughs> I said, that bill, that receipt is staying in my hands. If you want to make a copy of it and settle it, or search it out, you can, but that is my receipt. That is the proof that I paid this bill. And uh, in a sense, God's holding that receipt for us. 
it was nailed to the cross. Our sins, our debt has been paid. Uh, it's been taken out of the way. And in a sense, baptism pictures that for us as we're looking at the rites there. In Romans 6, we've been buried with him. We've been raised to walk in, in newness of life. I like the story of Exodus. Remember the children of Israel? They went through nine of the plagues. The first three, the children of Israel, along with the Egyptians, suffered from those plagues. And then God exempted them from the next several plagues until you come to the tenth one. And then everybody in Egypt was under the threat of the tenth plague. That is the death of the firstborn. And uh, yet God in his grace provided a way of escape for the children of Israel. They were to take the Passover lamb. They were to sacrifice that lamb. They were to put the blood on the, the lentils and, and the side of the, the, the door of their house. And you remember what God said when he sent the death angel through the land? He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's true of us today. He sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so our debt has been paid. And because of that fact, then our enemies are defeated in verse 15. Not annihilated, but disarmed, he says. How can that be? Well, Revelation chapter 12, beginning verse 10, says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them before our God day and night. He's accusing you before the throne of God. Look at, so how can, it, how can you say he's your child when he's doing this or that or so forth? And notice what, what he goes on to say there in verse 11. He says, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. God sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives even to the, the death there. He sees us because, uh, through the Christ, and he says, because you have accepted me, Satan's power has been defeated in your life. Satan's hold has been broken at the cross, and you are now safe in the arms of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he speaks of the fact that he always leads us today in triumph. From victory to victory. Uh, I like the story of Billy Graham. Uh, on one occasion, he was invited to meet with several senators in, in Washington, D.C. In the uh, dining room for the senators in the, in the Capitol building there. They, they were sitting down at the table together, and they were discussing some of the current events that were going on in our nation. And uh, much like today, if you were sitting there, you'd sense a lot of pessimism in, in, in the room. And finally, one of the senators said, Billy, are you pessimistic or are you optimistic? And Billy very quickly said, I'm optimistic. And the obvious question was then, well, when you look at all that's going on in the world, how can you be optimistic? And I like his answer to that question. He said, I'm optimistic because I've read the last chapter. And that is true of us today. Yes, there are a lot of things out there that we can be pessimistic about. But guess what? We're headed home. We're going to be with Christ in eternity. We have a glorious future ahead of us. We have everything to look forward to. Uh, and so we need to keep our focus on what Christ has done for us. The rites are important. Uh, the Lord's table, baptism, uh, all of this is important to us, but remember the substance is Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 49 uh, verse 7 through 9, it, it speaks of our possibility of salvation there. It says, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. Now don't you wish you could do that? Do you wish you could redeem your brother? The only thing you can do is share the gospel with him. Uh, it's the Spirit of God that's going to do the redemption there. Uh, I have had the privilege of introducing people to Christ. I've never saved any of them. That's the Spirit of God that's, that's done that. It, that's his job, not, not ours. It says, For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. We need to come to the point where we realize it's not our works that's going to get us to heaven. 
It's his work on the cross of Calvary. And we need to, I think, celebrate that fact and remember that fact and embrace that fact as we face the uncertainty of the future. A songwriter has put it, I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. We're safe in his hands. We can rejoice in, in that fact today. We need to take some time, I think, this week and celebrate, first of all, what he has done in us, and then we need to celebrate how he sees us today. We're forgiven. Our debt's paid. Our enemies are defeated. We can rejoice in the work of Jesus Christ in our lives and in our behalf today. And so as you think about that, are you rejoicing in his work, or are you struggling with some doubts? Well, how could he love me? Well, he did. He went to the cross to demonstrate that love for you. Don't live under the shadow of doubts today. Take some time and realize what does the scripture really say about your salvation? And then as you think of that, I realize shadows and rights have their place in our life. Maybe you need to take a step of obedience just to... Uh, in, increase your faith or to, to strengthen your faith or to encourage you in your faith. Uh, uh, do you need to go through the waters of baptism? Uh, is there some other area you need to surrender to the Lord? Why not do that today and enjoy all of the blessing that he has for you as you think of what he has done for you. Take some time and reflect on his work in your behalf this week. And I trust you'll take some time to go back over this passage because even as I was reading it this morning, I thought, you know what, I missed that point or, or I didn't cover that part. And I'm not going to go back over it for you next week. So you've got to do it this week. Read it, reread it, and take some time and thank God for everything that he has been doing in your heart and life as you consider the work of salvation in your life. Let's pray. Father, we just want to stop and rejoice in you today. We have been made complete in you, and we thank you for that. Father, we, we thank you that you've made us alive. You've given us new life, new birth. We thank you that, that our sins are forgiven, and the debt has been paid, and we rejoice in, in that fact today. Help us this week not to look at what's going on so much in the world around us is to look at what you are doing in our hearts and lives and that ultimately you are the victor and help us to keep that in mind as we walk through the events of this week we pray in jesus name amen